Hello, good evening. Welcome to uh, this evening's uh, The Bastani Factor. We have a fantastic guest on tonight, um, Alex Niven. Alex has written a great not-so-new book out with Repeater, New Model Island. We'll be talking about that, its contents, and the possibility or impossibility of radical Englishness, a radical England. Uh, welcome to the show, Alex. How are you doing? Hello, Aaron. I'm good. And you're How coming... You? Yeah, I'm good. You're coming in from the northeast. is that correct? This evening? Yes, sunny Newcastle. Sunny New... How is the weather? It is actually fairly sunny, so I don't have to lie too much. Good. Um, we've been talking so much on the, on the Vara Media, quite rightly, about coronavirus, about the, the, the leaked Labour report. Uh, but something I know that our audience is really passionate about is big ideas, uh, thinking strategically the next 10, 20, 30 years. And I think it's fair to say that the ideas around uh, Englishness, England, the future of a polity beyond the UK, within the territory which we presently understand as England, is going to be one of the big political issues, cultural issues, uh, over the next several decades. So I'm really happy we could talk about this book tonight. Uh, and I think it's this this space to talk about the bigger ideas, the longer term, which uh, is, is why I'm quite excited about the Navarra Media Project generally. In any case, with no further ado, you don't think that England really exists, do you? Um, well, so it's somewhat of a provocation, the kind of premise of a, the relatively short kind of polemical book is uh, that England doesn't exist. As I explain in the book, that's a, a hyperbole, a polemical hyperbole. Obviously, there is some sense in which England exists. Um, however, I don't, you know, I don't think it's too much of a hyperbole. Uh, I often kind of throw that back, that question back at people when they sort of um, when they put that to me and say, well, you know, what in what ways do you think England does exist? What you know, what what is specifically distinctively English? What entities are there? Um, what cultural uh, touchstones and kind of um, cultural reference points are there that that aren't uh, British, that are specifically English? Um, and in fact, I think there are very, very few. Um, that's for a number of pretty obvious historical reasons, mainly. Uh, this uh, kind of quite straightforward fact that England ceded a lot of its identity and its historical and political shape to uh, this kind of imperialist, uh, imperial entity, uh, Great Britain or the United Kingdom or, or whatever you want to call it. So it's it's somewhat of a provocation, something of a kind of polemical hyperbole on the one hand. On the other hand, I don't think it's too much of a hyperbole. I, I, I think England is an unusually um, elusive nation state if if it even is a nation state you know on its own separable from great britain or the united kingdom so if we just pull up graphic one uh, gary we'll be doing this throughout the show as just um excerpts from the book so if that's possible gary just bring that up uh this is towards the beginning of the book as you can see page uh, 13 one of the basic assumptions of this book is that england is a historical entity that has since the industrial revolution at the latest crossed over completely into mythopoeia, high confusion and self-contradiction. England has almost no basis in contemporary lived experience, excepting certain very limited juridical and bureaucratic contexts, dwarfed by immensely more significant political, legal and financial structures from the United Kingdom to the occulted power grids of global capital. Do you stand by that? I mean, that's that's a huge claim, isn't it? To say that the lived experience of of people in no way engages or connects with an idea of England or Englishness. Do you, do you think that's accurate? You know, you're obviously writing that maybe a year ago. Do you think that's fair? Um, well, I, I I suppose it's if people there's a kind of identitarian argument that says you know if people identify as English, then who am I to say um, uh, that that's wrong? Um, on the other hand, as you know, culturally, as a kind of culture-wide phenomenon that we can kind of objectively identify, um, I, I do stick by that. As you know, it picks on, up on what I what I was saying. I, you know, there, there are very few, um, uh, you know, very few essentially English, uh, uh, you, you know, cultural reference points or systems that exist. Uh, so, you know. So when, so when David Lammy says that on, on St. George's Day, he's proud to be English because of Walker's Crisps and Country Walks, do you, do you just think that's just, is that just stupid? Or you don't, you don't think there's any truth? Yeah, content? well, <laughs> Walker's Crisps. Really, yeah, he obviously well. feels that an attachment to, to something, right? To a certain sure. set of 
a certain set of cultural realities just because somebody can't adequately describe them doesn't mean they don't exist so it's, is this the 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 recent speech that lamy that david lamy i just saw it was, it was a tweet he put out on st george's day but the themes are in this new book of his yeah yeah well okay i i again who am i to kind of deny that 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 person feels like that at the same time it, it feels like a fairly weak um uh political cultural entity uh to be you know to to base a, a kind of national identity that means something and that's going to mean something in our kind of quite kind of parlous political moment on uh a crisp manufacturer and uh <laughs> i don't know walks in the country which you know and the, and the second of those being a classic example of something that is um people do in all countries i mean you know walks in the country presumably Presum <laughs> You know, presumably people, he it, means the English countryside, right? Which is a theme you, you sort of touch upon repeatedly in the book is this idea that we'll talk about this in a second about the contradictions between the idyll of the of the English countryside, the campagna, you call yeah. it, yeah. Uh, with the reality of a hyper-industrial modern country. Yeah, well, I you know, I don't think I I, I think I think I would be absolutely the, the English landscape and the English countryside exist, um, obviously as objective phenomena. Um on the other hand, that you know, we can't really that, you know, there's a kind of long tradition of Marxists, in particular Marxist, but, you know, um, uh, theoretical writing in general, which talks about how the, the ways in which the English countryside, you know, is a, a structure of feeling. It's been um, used in certain political ways, uh, you know. Um, so, I, you know, I don't think we can detach the sort of the, particularly, um, uh, you know, the kind of negative ways in which the English countryside has been used since the advent of capitalism, um, I, you know, I can foresee a time where we might in the future look at this countryside that exists within this kind of parameter of the notional parameter of England um, and do something kind of positive with that. But, um, you know, the, the kind of automatic association between that and the English and this kind of entity called England with a kind of flag um, and a kind of political shape at the moment just seems to me to be quite kind of tenuous and not um at the moment there doesn't seem to be any kind of positive political uh anything positive politically in that you know from a from a left point of view certainly gary can we pull up graphic two um building on the on the same point that you say earlier on the book if we can just get that up uh, morbid nostalgia, and this ties in really to what uh, Lamy is saying, I suppose. And, and that, I, I, I'm, I'm highlighting what David Lamy said because it's a common thing in the country. So. Yeah, yeah, sure. Morbid yeah. nostalgia is the evil twin of technological modernity. Ever since the early years, the Industrial Revolution, the acquisition and sale, fabrication, destruction of the synthetic past embodied in the commodities of English Gothic has been one of the truest, most naked expressions of the capitalist ethic and its roller coaster ride to death. Um, so, can, can you just kind of elucidate that that contradiction? Uh, because I think it's an important one. You know, if we think about the sort of the the archetype of the English populace, you think of Nigel Farage, what's he wearing? A flat cap. He's dressed like Rupert the Bear, a barber. He's out in the probably the Kent countryside, the Essex countryside. Yet he worked in the city of London in futures mm -hmm. trading, uh, raised an independent school, worked most of his life really in, in, in Brussels and Strasbourg as a, as a member of European Parliament. Is that peculiarly English? Uh, this contradiction within the identity of of the rural um, and and the sort of modern, and if so, why? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think I, in that part of the book, I'm I'm partly building on um, you know quite a famous sort of left or Marxist uh, tradition going back to uh, the Nairn Anderson thesis, a kind of series of articles that uh, Perry Anderson and Tom Nairn wrote in uh, published in New Left Review in the uh, mid 60s which talks about britain being uh britain or england again it's not quite clear we'll sort of keep coming back to that kind of infernal uh uh you know the difficulty of disentangling england from britain uh whatever it is this this country england or britain uh being unusually backward looking being in some way impeded in comparison in in, in comparison with other european continental uh, nations from kind of self-actuating, self-realizing itself in a modern context. Um, for you know, Nen and Anderson, it was this was partly because we had our revolution too early. Uh, so we had our revolution 
uh, in the 17th century. Um, so it was kind of premature, perhaps a bit primitive. Um, whereas, you know, France, for example, America, they had their revolutions at a time when, uh, you know, uh, at, at a more mature historical moment where they were able to kind of actualize their modernity. Um, I guess the, the the notion is that in England or Britain, we, we weren't able to do that. And as such, our culture is kind of unusually backward looking, unusually um, conservative at the same time as uh, the material basis of our culture has been, uh, was, you know, really kind of more advanced and, uh, you know, more modernistic and more kind of global and cosmopolitan perhaps than any other country in the world or certainly at an earlier stage. Um, and then, you know, it seems that there's some, there's something in that, isn't there? There's something, uh, you know, there's kind of a, a sort of almost a kind of sense that this, um, this sense of a kind of popular democratic uh, nationality or, uh, you know, in touch with a kind of um, international modernity, international kind of modernistic culture is being sort of suppressed and denied and kind of kept in check um by you know these kind of fantasies of the pastoral and you know these kind of this kind of eternal english countryside the english country garden and so on and so forth um you know which is you know quite oriented around kind of aristocrat you know kind of peasants and aristocrats these kind of medieval sort of feudal um uh dynamics um and you know it's it, it seems you know fairly obvious that this is uh, you know, getting in the way of or suppressing the sort of kind of modernistic culture you get in, you know, a country like France, in other European countries. So if we um, get graphic three, Gary, uh, you mentioned the Nairn Anderson uh, thesis, the curse motif that has recurred again and again over the past two millennia of British culture is therefore a rather bizarre feeling that England somehow does not quite exist and has indeed not been allowed to exist since the arrival of a mysterious evil at the start of its history. This is, if you like, uh, once some future impulse founded in the notion that the present is illusory, that the real nation will be revealed only when the curse is lifted. Um, and you, you sort of go on to say that, yeah, effectively the original sin of, of, of the English is the fact you have this early revolution which leads to Britishness. Mm. Uh, and this itself infuses a feeling of victimhood, right? There's, there's this idea that England, Englishness is repressed necessarily, uh, because of the formation of Britishness, often merely an extension of Englishness, but it's not called that. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. so when we're talking about the sort of underdevelopment of, of the of the sort of the, the national geist and how people understand their relationship to the English nation, English identity, where do you situate it? Do you think it's the Nan Anderson thesis, the fact that we had our revolution so early? or you situate it in the creation of the British Empire? Because there are other countries which obviously had quite early revolutions, France is one, uh, which had empires. Or do you think they're effectively two sides of the same coin? Essentially, it's the same phenomenon. Um, well, it, you know, where do, where do you want to start? You know, I think, well, it, it goes back to, uh, you know, you can, you can date it in various ways. Obviously, it goes back to a sort of feudal, context perhaps even to 1066 and this kind of um uh you know that's the kind of old myth of england isn't it that it was um uh you know we had this kind of continental invasion essentially which sort of suppressed the kind of authentic anglo-saxon um english nation state um you know i think there's, there's something in that you know when you look at the preponderance of norman surnames even today mm. um and the preponderance of our kind of aristocratic culture um i think that is quite that ob obviously is quite different to countries that had revolutions that were more successful in getting rid of their um uh aristocracy um so i think i think there's something in that um you know in a in an english or a british context the the, the kind of imperial the sort of settlement that you get after the sort of civil war and the glorious revolution is is a kind of combination of a kind of aristocratic cult, as we just sort of talked about this kind of aristocratic culture or you know kind of pastoral conservative feudal kind of you know cultural mythology with a much more kind of modernistic uh imperialistic 
uh, you know, uh, political framework. Um, so th and I think that that sort of double bind is something that we haven't really been able to escape. You know, we still kind of live in that, you know, to be English is, is, is you know, to have this kind of nostalgic pastoral, uh, you know, feudal, uh, you know, kind of mythopoeia, this kind of mythical cultural um, structure um, at the same time as having a kind of very aggressive capitalistic imperialistic um, actuality. So I think, you know, I, I, I don't think we've quite ever been able to escape from that. Let's talk about New Labour. Let's talk about the 1990s because it sort of okay. fills in quite nicely there. If we can just get the next <laughs> graphic, um, Gary. Uh, after several hundred years, when England was meticulously decentralised and distorted so that it could assume neighbouring and more distant lands, the still ongoing dismantling of the British Empire means that its rump polity has been left with nothing but the distant echoes of, pre of a pre-capitalist feudal past with which to reimagine itself. If we can do the next one, sorry. Uh, it's effectively the same point as before. One after that. Um, there we go. This is great. And this will get John Harris really angry. Or maybe not, actually. Maybe it's kind of it kind of confirms his point, I suppose, um, of the ultra-modernity of Blairism. Crucially, Britpop was never and was not especially supported by or related to any actual British or English nationalist movement. Indeed, in opting for a vague and irreverent modernization of Britishness, albeit one derived from nostalgia for the modernist 60s, we might say that Britpop forestalled the sort of back-to-the-land culture that would combine with calls to empower the English in ensuing decades. Can you... Can you sort of illuminate why you think that Britpop, as a, as a cultural moment, as a as a, as a, as a form of artistic output, why did that defy these sort of broader ideas of what Englishness was? What what was behind that? Why between say 1993 and and 2000 was there quite a big cultural outpouring, which didn't fall into these easy logics which you've just talked about? Sure. Yeah. So I mean, you know, we've sort of talked about these sort of deep time contexts. Uh, these, you know, contexts going back hundreds, if not thousands of years, um, you know, now we uh, try in the book to sort of really fast forward to this very specific uh, micro history of this kind of millennial Englishness. You talked about victimhood. I think this notion of English victimhood is really a very, very recent phenomenon, actually. Um, and I think, you know, we can date it you know, again, we can talk about various deep time contexts for this, but I think it's really the 90s, uh, the kind of close of the 20th century that you start to get this situation coming to a head. Um, I try to be sympathetic, actually, to to to, to Britpop, as, 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 as you suggest, um, in that it's it seemed to me, you know, it, it seemed actually in the 90s, there was a kind of, at least a potential for a sort of positive, or certainly more positive in relation to what came after, uh, debates about devolution um, and about national identity. There was a kind of a consensus in the late 90s, you know, across the board in, um, you know, in, in kind of historical writing, in culture, uh, you know, in music and kind of popular culture, um, that, you know, Brit Brit Britishness was kind of, you know, for all that Britpop was kind of awful in lots of ways, mm. um, there was, you know, there was an eclecticism to it. It wasn't. It wasn't. Do you know? It wasn't taking over those things that we just talked about. That you know, these kind of aristocratic pastoral fantasies mm. of, um, you know, a kind of feudal national identity. It was, you know, kind kind of modernistic, a kind of retro modernism, um, and you know, as I say, along underneath that and alongside that, you had uh, Scottish Welsh devolution. Uh, you had the kind of Northern Irish peace process. These actually, you know, to be fair to New Labour, you know, some of the kind of greatest achievements of New Labour, tellingly the, these things happening in the very, very early days of mm. you know, literally 97, 98. Yeah. Um, this kind of uh, the, what I would call the early experimental phase of, of Blairism. Um, you have this kind of, you know, various moments of possibility in the late 90s for uh, debates about devolution, uh, spilling over really into into the early 21st century, but then I think what happens very obviously then is you have this um, uh, real, you know, this is the moment at which Englishness really in earnest becomes a thing, and you start to see all all of these kind of um, you know highbrow, middlebrow, lowbrow, lowbrow books. Um, 
in bookshops, you know, looking at the English question and Englishness from various different angles. Uh, you have a kind of, as, as the t early 21st century wears on, you have a kind of popular culture uh, of, uh, you know, a kind of folk revival. You have mm. the kind of, the, the, uh, the, the horrific advent of uh, Mumford and Sons and that kind of new folk. Um, uh, uh, sort of trend in in in, in music um, and uh, you know in various ways this this sort of culture this, this sort of obsession with Englishness sort of builds in the early twenty first century. Why? Why? Because obviously, like you say, Blairism. There's a great book by Ricky Power Said about nineteen ninety seven. Stephen Lawrence Inquiry, Princess Diana, yeah. Labour winning yeah. the generation. It did feel like uh, you know I was a kid, but it did feel like there was there was a like you say a consensus around a modernist cosmopolitan political project, and and yeah. Yeah, I mean, we can say it was a missed opportunity or actually it wasn't really what we, we thought it was or whatever, probably a bit of both. Mm -hmm. But why so quickly does Labour move from being this cos sort of cosmopolitan values, very internationalist? You know, we know that uh, on the policy side, go away from identity and politics, Gordon Brown was looking to, not Gordon Brown, people around Tony Blair were looking to join the Euro. Gordon Brown was against it. But they, they, you know, they very ideologically look to international mm. institutions, multilateralism, Robin Cook, ethical foreign policy. How does that shift within just the space of three, four years? And behind it, of course, a very, like you say, very powerful, compelling, uh, popular culture, Britpop. There's that photo of Noel Gallagher at number 10 Downing Street. Mm -hmm. How do you go from that to this, this, this strange, aggrieved English nationalism in the space of, of five, six, seven years? What do you think powers that change? Well... I mean, there, there were several things. I mean, this is—it's re really the, the tragedy of, of, of Blairism um, that it is—it is such a kind of uh, this kind of infernal double pull between kind of good and evil, almost. Um, but you have, but I mean, in the uh, Richard Powell Said book, uh, that one of the things that does very well is pinpoint, uh, you know, the fact that even in the early days of Blairism, even as you have these very kind of uh, you know these ideas derived from the new left and even kind of euro communism um these kind of breakthroughs for these arguments you know quite radical arguments about devolution you know scottish devolution incredibly radical mm. thing to do um uh, but even as that's happening you have kind of jack straw uh you know saying some pretty dodgy stuff about immigrants uh and the kind of migrant camps in calais um and uh, as we know, that it was that side of Blairism that that, that won out as time progressed. This this kind of early optimistic, kind of modernist new left moment that you have in kind of ninety seven, ninety eight, going up to um, the millennium, perhaps that, that evaporated, um, such that by two thousand and three, you have this kind of insanely, uh, you know, uh, right wing foreign policy move of, of Iraq um, and, you know, we, we and all sorts of other examples of, of Blairism degrading into this kind of right wing centre right. So do you, do, you, do you, do you view that turn then that shift to this whole, this amplified Englishness, do you view that as the failure of, of the Blair Blairite project? Or do you, do you think there's something else going on? Is there something deeper going on? Because I remember watching Euro 96, you know, and, and that still is a quintessentially kind of Brit, Brit pop Englishness moment. But mm -hmm. as you detail in the book, even then, you, you it was the first time you'd see uh, St. George flags publicly, really. But yeah. even then, you'd see the occasional Union flag as a, as, a, as a totem of English football. After 96, it's it's just it's it's just ubiquitous, the English flag and, and, the, and the Union flag's gone. So, yeah. And that, that's, that precedes Blair. That's 1996. So are, yeah. are, there, sort of, are there deeper energies at work here? Yeah. And, and what are they? Well, is it, I mean, is, it yeah. the, is it the fallout of Thatcher? Is it the fact that we have the complete decimation of labour-based socialism, you know, the trade union movement? So we, we see the emergence of different kinds of identity and that, that's just one of them? Or Because it can't just be uh, yeah. Blair and Jack Straw being yet. arseholes, can it? No. I mean, that's I a mean, good clearly, answer, but... I mean, clearly you're talking about, you are talking about much, much deeper and in fact more global um, tendencies towards the rise of, um, or the return of, of, of the right and of right populism, um, uh, you know, which which is a kind of global thing. Um, you're talking about a kind of, you know, this kind of move away from a sort of postmodern late 20th century sort of deterritorialization, uh, 
and even globalization a kind of kickback against um that and a kind of resurgence of you know essentialist uh identities oriented around place and around the nation um so it's certainly not just it's not just kind of tony blair and jack straw being uh being bad um i mean yeah I, yeah you two, you you're talking about you you know there's a whole kind of there's a whole kind of other argument about, about the rise of the right and about right wing nationalism uh, let's actually we just talked about the the thing about Britpop. If we just put up the next graphic, Gary, this is about the England football team. Because you said something which might be quite counterintuitive to some people. In 1966, and I'm sure many of our sort of Welsh and Scottish uh, audience might not agree with this. In 1966, 1990, 1996, and 2018, especially, the success of the English national team has offered a fleeting glimpse of what might have been. Are you okay there, Alex? Yeah, I was just turning the light on. <laughs> let's let's pull that graphic back up, please, Gary. Uh, sorry. Uh, in 1966, 1990, 1996, and 2018 especially, the success of the English national team has offered a fleeting glimpse of what might have been in alternate reality, and I'm very glad you say this, Alex, one in which England developed into a modernistic European republic instead of a confused post-imperial half-nation founded on structured monarchism, financial services, and rentier capitalism. Now, for a lot of people, they think English football, they think hooligans, um, they think... Uh, Combat 18, they think Lansdowne Road, Ireland versus England, mid-1990s, um, Doug's. Why do you view the England football team as the avatar, actually a, a different kind of Englishness, a different kind of political formation, even if it's just in the abstract and isn't really yeah. a, a well, blueprint, so to speak? Yeah, well, I mean, personally, obviously, so the, in the book has various kind of memoir sections. Um, and I think, you know, it's often useful as a critic to... Um, to be open about where you're coming from personally, even if you don't let the kind of, it's important not to let that predominate. Uh, personally, I guess I have a kind of complex identity as as, as we all do. Um, but I, you know, I just don't feel any, you know, England, you know, the kind of argument about England not existing arises from a kind of personal feeling, not really of uh, anger or, um, Annoyance, just a sort of sense that I just don't, I don't get it. I, you know, I, when when people say, you know, I, you know, Englishness is about Walker's crisp and walking the countryside, it just seems kind of absurd to me. Uh, but the one, the great exception, the kind of capitalised great exception, as, as as I put it, is the England uh, football team, um, and perhaps that's just a personal thing. Um, but I, you know, I make the case. I try to make the case at least briefly in the book that. Uh, you know, English football is, you know, it, it, it's the ultimate thing that is different from that, you know, nostalgic, backwards, feudal, aristocratic, uh, cultural, uh, you know, myth structure. Um, it's it, it arises out of a, a working class modernist, you know, football's a modernist sport. It's a working class sport. Um it has the potential to offer some, you know, something different, a kind of truly, uh, you know, it's one of the few things that does genuine cultural things that does genuinely unite not all the nation, but a, a large part of it in a way that, there's, you know, there's some truth. Con there's some truth content there. When people talk, say, oh, well, you know, they, they articulate Englishness or a positivity to England through football because it's the World Cup or whatever. You think yeah. there's a particular truth content to that, which yeah. isn't there with country walks and warm beer and. Long yeah, shadows well, on cricket uh, grounds. Well, exactly. All of those things you've mentioned are very, you know, cl uh, you know, class specific and very niche things. Clearly, football uh, and the England football team in, in particular is um, is very, very far from perfect, and in fact, is kind of awful in in the ways that you've mentioned. Uh, it, you know, it's it, and it excludes, you know, it's pretty dodgy on kind of gender grounds and it's it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but you know, I'm trying to be generous. This is the best. I think this is the best, uh, the most, uh, yeah, in terms of truth content, this is the most, um, you know, at least offers a window into something yeah. that can just about uh, offer the sort, the, the more kind of comprehensive sense of national identity that, frankly, you do have in other, in other countries through political structures and through other cultural um, uh, touchstones. I completely agree. I mean, you had the World Cup in 2018, 
and you had three players from Yorkshire, you had a couple of players from you know Manchester, Londoners, yeah. mixed race, working class. And actually, that was an expression of, of the country. There are yeah. people beyond the public schools, there are people beyond Oxbridge, there are people who aren't just white, there are people who are working class. And, and that, like you say, that there's the truth content there of an, of an actual place which I recognise when I walk out the door, yeah. which I don't see when I'm looking at, you know, necessarily the House of Commons or BBC Politics Output or any number of cliches operate, you know, operating in our sort of yeah. in our cultural sphere about what England and Englishness is. So, do you, do you think then that that, that that's something which should inform the left? I mean, because it would again, if I was to put that to a sort of Welsh or a Scottish comrade, they would say how absurd but do you think that there's there's a possibility there there's a glimpse there of a different kind of englishness a different kind of england because that's something you then proceed to not argue for in the rest of the book well i just think again it's so um it, you know it's it's that's such a small prov and provisional example um i you know i wouldn't have a problem with that being the seed of something bigger, but I, but I think that is just, it's not enough, you know, the England football team is not enough to base a political nation state and a kind of cultural, uh, a kind of massive cultural identity on. It's, it's almost the exception that proves the rule. Uh, right. It, you know, it's, 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 it's a kind of tantalizing glimpse of what, what could have been if we didn't have this kind of awful history, essentially. Right. I understand. So we don't have the political, the legal institutions, all these other things. Let's go to the, the final part of the interview. We've got a question in about 15 minutes. Um, you talk about the, the sort of the, the political proposal here. And I think it's, it has to be taken really seriously. You know, when we advertised the show, I thought people will be like, oh, God, Navarro is getting into like English civic nationalism, which is not what we're doing. And th your book certainly doesn't do that. No, no, no. But I, but I think it's, it's fair to say that with the sort of disintegration of um, of the British polity of the British nation state, whether or not Scotland leaves, we're clearly going to see further devolution to mm. Scotland, to Northern Ireland, to Wales. Uh, so that question of England as a political entity has to be answered one way or another. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And your answer is what you call deep regionalism, alt England, and this idea that actually a really uh, effective propositional politics should be uh, building. A sense of fidelity to regions of England, i.e., uh, the southwest or Wessex or the southeast, or in your case, Northumbria. Can you sort of sketch that out a bit? Because Northumbria, as a, as a kingdom, as a, as a as a real political entity, hasn't existed for eleven hundred years. So I wonder mm. why you think that's a more plausible um, platform for collective belonging and togetherness than England. Well, I I I I, I don't. I don't think that. I don't think. I mean, I use the example of Northumbria actually um, as a as a point of comparison with England. As you as you say, Northumbria hasn't really existed for uh, a thousand years or thereabouts. Um, but England hasn't really existed for um, so, you know certainly three over three hundred years, if if you know if not longer. Um, so you know, I'm using that as I'm sort of saying, well, um, if you want to go back into these kind of Im essentially imagined. You know these kind of vanished kingdoms, um, and and talk about reviving this. You know this sort of Englishness based on, you know, uh, this you know historical version of England that you know existed. You know, three hundred years ago when the population was what six or seven million, and mm. you know, a, a sort of graft that sort of artificially onto a twenty first century context when you've got you know fifty sixty million. And you know, incredibly diverse, huge modern modern population and modern society. Then why not do it with Northumbria? I, you know, I don't actually think we should do either. But I think uh, a modernistic regionalism, which does you know, gen, you know, basically map onto the you know the kind of northeast to southwest, um, a heptarchy, a heptarchy, yeah. Not not exactly, but not exactly a little uh, bit. Yeah, a little bit, you know. But I, but I think more by coincidence, actually, uh, than you know, Northumbria, for example, was at its largest extent, you know, went from kind of Edinburgh right down to the Humber. Mm. Um, clearly, we don't, you know, that that sort of region is is not tenable at all. We would, wouldn't have, uh, you know, in a kind of modernistic uh, civic regionalism, we, Scotland. Edinburgh clearly wouldn't be a part of Northumbria, and you'd probably have the Northeast and Yorkshire as two different 
um, regions. Um, so I'm, I'm not kind of arguing for a kind of nouveau Northumbrianism. No, no, no. Um, you know, nevertheless, I, you know, I do think those some of those kind of his histories are important, and if if only as a way of proving really that the, the kind of in, you know this notion of a kind of coherent English history and mythological, uh, you know, shared mythology is is very complicated because you know you go back to you know Anglo the Anglo Saxon or kind of early medieval, the early medieval island, and it's, uh, you know, it's not a kind of unified um, English state. It's, you know, competing kingdoms which traverse yeah. England and Scotland and don't include Cornwall and perhaps Devon, you know, we don't quite know, and, and Wales. Um, so I'm sort of, again, venturing it into deep time to sort of complicate the, the question. But I do, you know, I do think the answer is, the answer to this contemporary moment, which you... Um, uh, which you mentioned is uh, that you know the kind of breakup of Britain. Clearly, Scotland is is probably going to become independent. I think that's likely, more likely than not. Similarly, Irish reunification more likely than not. Wales, I think, uh, not quite as likely. Um, Welsh independence is not really, um, not really there, or won't be really there for the next uh, couple of decades. I don't think. Um, so you're going to have to sort of you're going to have to come up with an English response to that. I think the worst thing that can happen is you just kind of have a kind of London centered, you know, kind of in, you fall back into this kind of London centered sort of imperial uh, English culture and English history. Um, I think a much better solution is, is to have a kind of modernistic civic regionalism uh, oriented around, um, well, there are various different ways of, ways of doing it. So let's get down to the brass tacks of policy. Mm -hmm. uh, if you were to sort of articulate a really, I think it's a very popular populist kind of demand, you could say we we have Scot Scottish Parliament, we have a Welsh Assembly, let's have an English Parliament. I, and I think that's a perfectly legitimate thing for the left, left to say. The left hasn't said it, but it, it's, you know, um, it's a perfectly, it's consistent with the, 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 the constitutional settlement for other parts of the country. You could say, well, let's put it in Derby or let's put it in Leeds. Let's take power out of London. That, that could be one left demand. Where you seem to be going at is devolution, a federal state, a federal yeah. policy. Yeah. Uh, why? Why do you think that the? Why do you think the second is better than the first? Would you think uh, there would be too much repetition of the kind of previous status quo with with that? Or? Uh. Well, yeah. I mean, I think it, it's yeah. I mean, an English Parliament in in Derby would would be interesting if if that was ever allowed to happen i sort of don't well the tories the tories were talking about putting the, the second house in york weren't they yes well it would be the house of lords for them obviously so yeah. i mean and york it, without wishing to offend anyone from york is is a you know that's a kind of tory mm. although york itself is a labor seat um you know kind of it's surrounded by tory seats and and york is a kind of um uh you know very picturesque uh, you know, kind of cathedral mm. city. It's you, you can understand why you know that that is about as far as the the kind of Tories are going to get in terms of um, uh, devolving power. Is this kind of you know the house putting a House of Lords in this kind of picturesque cathedral city in North Yorkshire? But it's still. Do you uh, not think? Do you not? I, I when I when I read that, I still thought it's a big deal. You know, to take to take one of the to take the second chamber out of Westminster. That's a, for the Tories. That's a huge thing. You know, they did. They were yeah. they were sort of defending hereditary peers thirty years ago. Well, I I can't remember. Was were they actually going to get rid of? Uh, is it? It would still be the House of Lords, though, wouldn't it? It wouldn't be a. I presume so. Yeah. Or, yeah. So it, it would presumably still have that kind of establishment, you know, kind of uh, old white men aspect to it. Um, yeah. But yeah, you know, a big deal. But I don't think it would. I don't think it's going to kind of smash the. <laughs> the the kind of thousand year old English establishment essentially just to have the you know this second chamber which presumably wouldn't have too too many powers um, in in York um, so you know a much more radical left socialist uh, response would be would be a civic regionalism you know I think it, it as I sort of say in the book there's a kind of rationalist uh, planning aspect to this in that. The, re the the English regions have populations, you know. Surely, in a in a kind of utilitarian sense, that's one way that you should 
uh, look at it in terms of the kind of size of the population, uh, that the English regions have populations that are equivalent and in some cases bigger than, uh, you know, Scotland, Wales, and uh, well, it depends whether you talk about Ireland as a unified entity. Um, but, you know, kind of Northwest England, I think, has a population of something like a seven or eight million to Scotland's, you know, five or six million. Um, so, you know, there's a kind of utilitarian argument about, you know, England is actually a huge country. Um, and you know, there's, there is this kind of leftist uh, cliche about, you know, us being a kind of small island. It's not that small an island, actually. Um, but it's big in the sense that it has a, a big population and it has lots of, hu you know, human beings in it. It's, it's, it, and, it, and it's very are you, diverse. Are you trying to say we're full up, Alex? And I, and I get out the statistic <laughs> about the golf courses and houses. That's I'm joking. I'm joking. Not what I'm saying. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. Uh, but no, as a Northern European country, it's a, it's a big, you compare it to the Scandinavian countries, yeah. uh, Netherlands and so on. It's a big, big country, England. Yeah. Well, and also in our kind of British Isles context of, you know, we're thinking about what's going to happen to Scotland. We're thinking about what's going to happen to Wales and Ireland. Um, uh, yeah, you know, and, and I think actually small, the small nation is is a kind of, there's this kind of long tradition of the small nation as a kind of leftist, uh, you know, that's the kind of nationalism that uh, we on the left can kind of do business with a kind of small, open, liberal, cosmopolitan uh kind of civic entity as opposed to the bigger sort of imperialist uh nation um which will always tend towards you know kind of domination and oppression and so on and so forth. you know once you get a kind of once you get past a certain mass of population and a certain kind of land mass you know you have to have the kind of imperialistic patterns of the kind of strong mm. center and the kind of colonization and etc cetera, etc cetera. whereas you know you have a kind of nation like scotland which uh, has a population of five or six million. Um, you know, it, it. You know, there's. It's a. It's a much more kind of positive, modernistic, civic. Uh, you know, structure in in potential at least. And I think you know, we should apply that to the English regions as well. There's a there's a question here. We'll put you, please put your questions in the um, in the comments with a rocket emoji. We've got uh, 1,100 people watching, 393 likes. Smash the like button. We're going to be doing these kinds of shows every Tuesday. Tiski's of course Monday. Uh, Wednesday, Friday. I'll be doing these interviews every Tuesday. It's great to have you tonight, Alex. Um, this is a really good question uh, from Fuck This. My apologies. Uh, <laughs> if England isn't radical, where do you think a lot of the anti-London sentiment originates? That's, I think that's a brilliant question. So, um, do, you, do you think that this kind of this this antipathy to London? Do you think that that's a, there's a there's a there's a radicalism sort of the kernel of radicalism there? Yeah, I, I, I mean. I, I'm not actually making the point that I mean, I, I think clearly there are lots of radicals and radical cultural tendencies within England or Britain or whatever. I'm not saying that they don't exist. Clearly, they do. Um, so I, you know, I think anti-London sentiment is, is is an outgrowth of a certain kind of radicalism. Um, it can be good. It can be bad. I think you know the the kind of uh, reorganizing England or Britain so that London isn't such a kind of towering, um, doesn't kind of tower so monolithically above everywhere else is a good thing. But that's not to say that I don't think, I don't think London should be kind of swept into the sea. It's obviously has lots of great things about it, but yeah, clearly there are, you know, England has lots of kind of hidden uh, and marginalized radical tendencies within it. It's just that I don't think that they're necessarily, they're, I, I don't think they're necessarily, in, their Englishness is essential to their. Yeah, I get that. I think that's, I think that's, I think that's, I think that's a good response. Great question from Billy Neville. Um, decided to write a short UD paper on English nationalism after reading NMI, New Model Island. Alex, which books would you recommend for research, especially regarding post evolution English identity? Um, post dev uh, post deep devolution, as in wh which uh, which which what, what, what were you, we've talked briefly about, for instance, um, Nairn Anderson. So, what kinds yeah. of you know? Let's pick four or five books that you think would be a really good um, primer into these debates around English nationalism and uh, political identity after Britain. Um, yeah. So, I mean, anything by uh, 
Tom Nairn, Perry Anderson, particularly Tom Nairn, obviously there's, you know, the, the, his kind of long um, uh, sort of development of the, you know, the notion of a kind of progressive leftist Scotland, and you know, anything by Tom Nairn. Um, you know, I think uh, if you want to get into the progressive patriotism stuff, Billy Bragg's The Progressive Patriot would be, would be a decent place to start. Um, if you want to look at the sort of center left kind of blairite um campaign for in, you know england look at you know anything by articles or uh pieces by you know john denham or anthony barnett um what else but i mean you would disagree with them quite extensively wouldn't you like yeah anthony we did a great podcast it's um on environment.com if you sort of google anthony barnett james butler and Anthony Barnett said that, you know, one of the problems with the English left is our refusal to admit, or the, the left in England, is our a refusal to admit that we are an English left. Mm. Um, well, I did, yeah, I do disagree with that, yeah. And he, and mean, he, and he thinks that's, and you know, uh, he's talking about many of the same things you're talking about because of the, the you know, sort of ideological hangover from empire. Um, we disavow the reality of, of, of mm. the, the parameters within which we operate. And so he... he you know, I mean, whereas you saying, you know, to sort of identify with an English nation is a form of um, is a form of alienation. You know, he would say, actually, we're alienated by not identifying as English leftists. Yeah, no, I do disagree with that. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, um, I, yeah, I mean, part of the reason I wrote the book is because, yeah, I'm sort of trying to make a, a relatively um, original contribution to the field and sort of kicking against this recent culture but i mean a lot of the writing about devolution it, you know it's quite embryonic um so for example there was a, a really good ippr north report published just before christmas about um you know the need for kind of regional organization um i can't i'm trying to think off the top of my head of a, a, a book about you know offering uh models of civic regionalism i'm you know i'm sure there are it's re remiss of me that i can't kind of think of them but i'm sure there are lots but i yeah this is a great question from dar bpa what effect do you think the long war in um in ireland had on british identity well again you know is it british or is it is it english um the long war in ireland is this well is i this... suppose well i suppose both no, but the, I suppose, since, well, I, I presume from 1916 to effectively 1997, the fact that we were at war for large periods of time or occupying a country next to us. I mean, do you think that had a major impact on the British identity, the English identity, the English psyche? Um, I that's not, it, that's it, not that's not a, that's not a, that's not a, a, a polity of equals, is it? You know, there are many, you know, it's like, you know, California occupying Mississippi or something, you know, nobody would think, oh, yeah, they're equal partners in a... No, no. Union. Yeah, I mean, I think it did in, in certain kind of ghostly ways. I mean, you see it reappear, reappearing even in the 2019 election, the kind of Corbyn and Corbyn being a kind of IRA, well, terrorist in, in some uh, in some readings. Uh, you know, the, the the kind of ghost of um, of Ireland is a, is a kind of ghost that haunts British imperialism. Obviously, it is, but I mean, generally, I'd see the Irish independence movement as a, as a kind of long process of um, the start of the end, you know, the, the United Kingdom was very, very successful really with certain kind of, ex you know, with one or two exceptions, it was very, very successful for a couple of hundred years from the start of the 18th century to the start of the 20th century. And then you start, you know, from about a hundred years ago with, with the Easter rising, you start to see the unraveling of the United Kingdom. And I, I think I would put Ireland in that in that bracket, and you know, in Scotland, and Scotland's a kind of later iteration of that, and perhaps Wales, you know, an even later iteration of that. But I think you know, I think the United Kingdom has been unraveling since the Easter Rising, essentially. Yeah. Uh, great question from Joe Skierping. Are you dreading VE Day, Victory Over Europe Day? That's next. Fr it's this Friday, right? Are you dreading it, Alex? Well, I'd, obviously, there's a leftist. Uh, you know, it was, we we. We kind of smashed fascism, didn't we? Yeah. Um, so there are leftist ways of of looking at the Second World War. I fear that they will not be centre stage, <laughs> shall we say? Um, 
but you know, it's I don't I don't resent the easy, you know, as I say that you know that's that was a that was a kind of um I'm you know, I'm thankful that we, we smashed hit there. Um, I suppose I'll, I'll rephrase the question because I'm, I'm not dreading it. I think uh, I think dread is a, uh, but I know what the the person is means by that. Um, mm. Obviously, I think yeah. what what was achieved in 1945 was exceptional, a great deal to be grateful for. Um, but I suppose it, it's there even in the term. You know, the rest of Europe, I believe, calls it peace over Europe or peace in Europe day, mm. whereas we call it victory in, in Europe day. I mean, to what extent do you think that this is just one manifestation, isn't it, of the kind sure. of strange? Um, um, dissonance internal to the British slash English psyche. So, you know, Scots would celebrate it. And there are unionists in Scot. There are you know, you know, all kinds of strange or um, mundane political identities in Scotland. But how things like VE Day are commemorated in Scotland seem far more far more coherent than you might see here. Or is that a, uh, is that a misreading? Do you think it does feel to me like these military occasions, particularly for the English polity, are are celebrated in increasingly odd ways. Yeah, I mean, obviously, the the ways in which VE Day will be marked, I completely sympathise with the with the question. Will be ninety percent awful. Um, you'll have yeah these very confused uh, national. You know, again, is it you know will it will it be the kind of Union Jack or will it be the St George flag? Um, you'll have yeah all sorts of politicians lining up to wheel out. Uh, cliches and stereotypes about English militarism that are, range from, you know, ill thought through to morally unconscionable. Um, so yeah, of course it'll be awful. But you know, the the I I I guess I was just you know the actual date of of V Day, Peace in Europe Day, or kind of you know defeat of Hitler Day is is not something I object to. Do you think, I mean, do you, I mean, it's something I see, you don't use these terms in the book. We'll finish with this, I guess. Do, do you see the regionalist um, agenda as a means of defanging the bad things you like about uh, this ersatz English nationalism? And one of them is clearly a sort of militaristic default. Do you think if, if, if somehow in 20, 30 years time, we did have a federated country of some kind and people increasingly felt drawn to their city or their region, do you think that would defang some of these more kind of nativist and militaristic uh, sources of identity we're presently seeing, which have grown particularly really since, particularly since the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, actually? Yeah, well, I mean, never say never. I, you know, as I, I, I sort of, again, talk about in the book, uh, as a kind of, uh, I have a sort of weird in, encounter with the this kind of blood and soil Northumbrian uh you know, very, very marginal inter internet tendency was was actually probably just one one guy, <laughs> um, but clearly, clearly, you can have a yeah, you can have a kind of militaristic regional mythology building up. But I think really it it'll be much more difficult to um, for that to happen. I think you know the tendency is again with you know you, when you have a kind of smaller nation, a smaller polity. You know, built around certain, um, you know, shared cultural reference points that aren't ethnic, that are kind of based on, you know, where you live and your kind of city and your kind of municipal and civic structures, as opposed to any kind of myths about your kind of ethnicity or your blood or whatever. Um, I think clearly that is that is in at least in potential a much more positive because you, I mean, you have to divide the world up somehow. You, even in an international socialist utopia, you can't have um, you know, everyone ruled from, I don't know, a kind of satellite, uh, you know, orbiting the Earth. You have to cyber, divide cyber sin. And, yeah, yeah, well, it, it did, it did. But, but you have you have to have kind of civic units. Um, it just seems to me that you know a kind of unit of about you know between three, four million and about ten million is a is a you know that's a much. It's much less likely to devolve into a sort of imperialistic, militaristic. Uh, in a in a in egalitarian polity, it's it's much more likely to be uh, to be in touch with its kind of civic surroundings and its kind of um, you know its positive potential. Okay, well, I think we'll leave it there, Alex. Thanks very much. As I've said, actually, you know what the the book is. I think I think it was one of the best books I've I, I've read this year. I read it early this year, or maybe late last year. But it's so written. Awesome. 
That's very kind. It, I think I messaged you at the time and said it's a really superb read. Um, so, so thanks for coming on. Uh, Michael is back tomorrow with Tisky Sarah. I'm not sure of the guest. If you've not clicked subscribe, please do it. Michael is desperate for us to get to 100,000 subscribers, I think, by August. And that's just something he just keeps on talking about. So make Michael happy. Click the subscribe button. Um, I will probably be back on Friday with Michael. I'm not so sure, but it's very likely. Uh, until then, good night.